Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have Ambassador Bhadra Kumar with us and we are going to discuss something that he's been following very keenly over the years. That is, of course, the Iran, the United States nuclear standoff, particularly with Trump reneging on the US agreement, pulling out of the nuclear agreement. And what has followed is Iran slowly stepping up the pressure on the at least the American allies that they should do something concrete about the deal. Otherwise, it's a completely non. Uh, it's completely something which Iran cannot accept if it continues this way. Do you think, Ambassador Bhadra Kumar, that there is now some possibility of change with Biden having taken in the process of taking over in the U.S. because we don't know which way things may still fall out. Looks like now the uh, game is over for Trump. Thank you, Prabir. Uh, let me, first of all, let me wish you a very happy new year. You've done a lot of uh, uh, very good work, high quality work. Uh, um, every sense I look at it through the last year and I hope uh, this good work will continue. And probably, you know, you will step up further. Wish you all the best. And thank you. you know, thank you. Same to you too. Yeah. Now, uh, you see, the uh, first point is the transfer of power. Trump has now conceded openly. Uh, to my mind, uh, the uh, kind of precipitate situation that he tried to create in Washington has boomeranged. And from this point onward, it's a downhill slide for him, for Trump, because um, I heard on uh, BBC radio early this morning uh, some interviews, it's a program of interviews from the political class in the US. And uh, I find that uh, even uh, not only the top figures like uh, Graham, Lindsey Graham, even uh, middle level uh, politicians in the Republican Party uh, find that uh, this is something Trump is carrying it in a way, proceeding in a way that is uh, detrimental to America's long-term interests and the political foundations of the state. So I think the, uh, we can uh, safely assume that uh, Trump's exit is certain. The second point is that uh, I think the uh, chances of his playing the role of a spoiler in the sense uh, to create some sort of a ugly situation from a military point of view involving Iran, which is something that uh, Israel wanted badly. And even the United States as uh, allies in the Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia in particular, had also been uh, looking forward to. I think that's not going to happen now. Uh, so uh, in the remaining 13 days, the uh, Iran issue is not likely to flare up. Let me put it like that. That's also a second good thing. And the third thing is the incoming election results from uh, Georgia, the Senate runoff uh, elections. And if uh, one is already in the bag of the Democrats and the other one is seems to be also leaning that way. And if uh, that is the case, then uh, we have a position here where the House of Representatives and the Senate are both in uh, the control of the Democrats. Uh, this would uh, certainly strengthen Biden's hands uh, across the board, not only on the Iran issue. But in the case of Iran issue, uh, there was always the apprehension that uh, the uh, Israeli lobby and the residual influence that the Saudis have in the Beltway might be deployed to stall any real progress. I think that uh, uh, there, on that score, I think Biden is now going to be on a stronger wicket. This is the third point which is going to work in the favor. So uh, we have in the, in the course of the past 24 to 48 hours, dramatic things have happened in the US politics, which, uh, uh, which are going to be game changers. 
that's how so, i evaluate so uh, you expect the biden administration to be able to recontinue the old jcpoa agreement bring it back in some form you see pradeer the uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, much of what trump has done is possible to undo uh, from biden's point of view through executive orders that is uh, iran's uh, primary demand is with regard to uh, lifting the sanctions correct uh, now getting back into the jcpoa is uh, a different process altogether but iran has uh, indicated that if uh, the sanctions are lifted it is quite willing to roll back the steps that it has taken in terms of its enrichment program and other attendant details and perform once again within the four walls of the jcpoa which means the purity of the enrichment process should be kept to a low level 3% or something like that uh, stockpiles will not be there because earlier time also the purified uranium was taken away to russia yes. which was storing it under, under the under the deal, 20, 2015 deal now that was not possible because uh, trump imposed sanctions so the stockpiles are increasing and according to a report i saw uh, a week ago or something in the iaea the as of august of september already the stockpiles had increased to something like 12 times what has been uh, provided for under the jcpoa yes, so but it's still much lower than what was there in 2015 so that's the other side of it yeah that is other side but uh, the point is uh, the point i am making here would be this that uh, the timeline is going to be very important first as we both agree the climate has become more conducive for a uh, for a forward movement for an end of the stalemate the political opinion generally in the us is also leaning towards this that uh, the maximum pressure approach toward iran has not brought the expected results or the results that trump promised which is that uh, iran would be in a much weaker position iran is uh, uh, iran is certainly weak in one sense in terms of the sanctions having a debilitating effect on its economy but on the other hand we don't see any perceptible shift in the iranian attitudes and uh, so there is also right a wide recognition would i be right in saying that what you're saying is it is possible to bring back is not baby the us into the jcpoa which is a different uh, issue but at least that iran continues to adhere to the jcpoa terms and the sanctions are lifted and more importantly the european union is also able to trade with iran because because of the sanctions that's what they were not able to do it's really the financial sanctions that uh, was biting the countries including india that you couldn't really trade with iran because your banking system or whatever financial instruments you have they will all kind of um, come under us sanctions it is not international sanctions but us sanctions and unfortunately the financial controls of the world still are with the united states you see there are two broad categories of uh, us sanctions on iran as you know us sanctions on iran uh, have been a reality ever since the islamic revolution correct so uh, let's be clear that uh, on this plane today we are discussing the nuclear related sanctions correct then there is the other bit of sanctions which are also very severe uh, in terms of non nuclear issues that is uh, iran's uh, regional policies uh, the us allegation that iran is uh, uh, masterminding terrorist groups operating in the region that it is uh, policies are detrimental to american regional interests and the security of its allies and so on so there is a package of sanctions relating to that which date back actually to the early 1980s the time of that from the time of that hostage crisis immediately after the revolution iran is not uh, getting into that part that is something which is uh, 
lead to a normalization of relations with Iran with between the two countries, which is going to take a long, long time. What we are talking about are the nuclear sanctions. And you have exactly, exactly summed up when you said that the uh, nuclear sanctions, once they are removed, Iran couldn't care less whether the other sanctions, the non-nuclear san American sanctions are in place or not, because the JCPOA then provides a very high degree of almost total integration of Iran into the world economy. Now, uh, which means it can generate even its own income, let alone the block funds. The block funds will have to be released, which runs into fantastic amounts, very big amounts, you know, tens of billions of dollars. But apart from that, on a day-to-day -day basis, Iran can generate its own income because it can sell oil. Okay. And those who want oil can buy it from Iran. So the market forces then come into play. And Iran is quite happy with that. And then uh, the, there is no particular distress in Iran, in the society. The economy can start moving uh, into a state of normalcy and so on. So what you said is absolutely the point. The point is that once the sanctions are uh, removed, the Trump sanctions on nuclear thing is removed, then the JCPOA's full potential is liberated. And uh, then uh, Iran can uh, come back to a state of normalcy. So that is what is important. And uh, the, uh, the, the main factor here is we have to discuss that. There we get into the Iran uh, domestic situation. The main that factor is other, here is- That is the other thought. question I wanted to ask you. Would the, uh, yeah. having, having this face this pressure of the United States and the belief that United States is not treaty capable, even if it removes under Biden the sanctions, four years later, again, a fresh set of sanctions can come in. And therefore, the Iranian positions, can it hard, harden to the extent that they will then not normalize relations? Would that be a, something which would stand in the way? Is that possible? You see, Iran will uh, certainly have drawn certain lessons from its experience. But um, having said that, what happened also didn't come entirely as a surprise to Iran because it was always on guard that this sort of an eventuality may develop. The goalpost may get shifted further, etc. But uh, here, you know, the advantage for Iran is that uh, if the agreement is not jettisoned and the agreement is preserved, uh, whether the United States is part of it or not, this is not very important because the agreement has a dynamics of its own. For example, as of last October, Iran is now possible to trade in weapons. And by 2024, the capping on Iran's uh, ballistic missile program is going to be lapsing. In fact, the, the, the uh, period beyond, uh, Iran is going to uh, re regain all its prerogative and rights as a non-NPT nuclear member state. As you know, the safeguards which have been in, in, uh, imposed on Iran are unprecedented. Yes. No country on earth has ever accepted this sort of a uh, this sort of a tight regime. So more than what tight, I meant was that, that more than tight Iran more than tight, a very, very intrusive IAEA regime. In fact, one of the issues of that is have the past the IAEA inspectors passed information yeah. which the United yeah. States used yeah. in the uh, assassination of uh, the nuclear physicist, Fakhri Zadeh. You see, that is exactly what I meant, that uh, extremely intrusive inspections and uh, Iran at every stage uh, had, had to concede more ground to them, like they can hold surprise inspections. They can enlarge the list, like India also has an agreement with IAEA. But you know better than I do, 
that that is on the basis of a certain charter, a certain listing out of our assets, and they are restricted to those assets. But in the case of Iran, it's not like that. The inspectors suddenly one fine day, you know, get a feeling that X Y Z installation may have something to do. They suspect they have information. Then Iran comes under pressure to open up that also. This has happened in the also in the past. Yes, of course. So you see the um, the point here is that uh, uh, despite all that, uh, if Iran agreed in the 2015 deal, that is because Iran fundamentally doesn't have any intention to make nuclear weapons. And in uh, I would imagine that in terms of their political culture and the Islamic system. They do take very seriously the fatwa that has been that had, that was given by Imam Khomeini, and it is I don't think any leader in Iran would have the gumption to bypass it, and uh, he has called it anti-Islamic, you know, to to make nuclear weapons like this. It's a horrifying weapon, and you know that's the kind of uh, mindset that Iran has on this issue. So that is never very important for them, and uh, this uh, enrichment in a big level or huge stockpiles of uh, enriched uranium and so on is not very important for them. Uh, they agreed for the 2015 deal because even if there is a passage of time up to 2024, where they may have all these restrictions on them, there is going to be a future. Where they will be, they can get rid of all this and live a normal life as a member of the world community in every sense, and can get market forces to prevail, because we must understand that uh, this is a country which is uh, phenomenally rich in mineral resources, and it's not just oil and gas. Across the board, you know, it's very rich in minerals. And uh, it has got a very big market, relative terms, close to about a hundred million people. And it has got also another thing: a very strong, well-developed uh, agriculture, and uh, and uh, by far the highest capacity of any country in that region, any any regional state, in the absorption of technology, high technology. It's a very innovative. Uh, society society also the human resources are uh, very rich and uh, you look at the kind of we you know the kind of uh, weapon systems with all these sanctions and every all the handicaps they had that they were able to develop in a way that the united states has now forgotten that there is even a military option against iran you know they did not do that so you see all these things make it very clear that uh, the iranians are confident that if the nuclear sanctions are lifted they will become unstoppable as a regional global power you know this is this is the point and that uh, uh, we have to uh, put aside the western propaganda about iran it's it's not like that at all that countries uh, it was it's Culture, its endowments, and so on. So uh, I think they are uh, uh, they made their calculations. But you write from the experience of the 2015 deal, uh, they will have drawn certain conclusions. And if at any moment they are going to get into any kind of uh, negotiations and deal with the United States, not only the United States, I think the Europeans also uh, didn't really fulfill. We know that. They, they they stayed on. Uh, they, they 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 profess their interest in preserving the uh, JCPOA. They disagreed with the American exit from the JCPOA, and they urged Iran constantly to abide by the terms of the JCPOA. But they didn't fulfill. The moment the American election uh, is sanctions were imposed, the European companies scooted. and uh, the european governments did not really give any kind of protection which would have encouraged their own countries national companies to stay put in iran so you see uh, it's a harsh world you know and uh, we have to uh, we have to recognize that but within all that uh, 
I think uh, the Americans understand now that uh, this is a road to nowhere. And uh, only by coming back into the uh, framework from this platform and negotiating. Now, you have seen the Jake Sullivan's uh, interview with uh, Farid Zakaria. Now, you know, it's a very interesting point, uh, Prabir, that he did not mention about negotiating another nuclear deal. He spoke about follow on negotiations. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it's very, very in, in, important distinction he has made there. Okay. That is a signal to Iran that they are not going to, Americans know that Iranians will not renegotiate this deal. And that there has to be uh, a forward movement in a different way. So that point has been considered. And overall, I think Sullivan's remarks, and Sullivan's remarks are very important because Sullivan was the person who opened the back channel, operated the back channel, and create and brought the situation to that point where John Kerry and Wendy Sherman stepped in and began negotiating. So he, he had a very big role at that time in that. And he knows the subject, he knows the protagonists in Tehran. And uh, therefore, that is why his uh, interview was uh, of uh, much interest, actually. No, I, I think what you are saying sounds extremely logical. Of course, as you know, when it comes to world history, events sometimes do not follow logic. But nevertheless, the forces at this point of time seem to be tipping towards the direction that you've suggested. And I think one very important point that you have made, that Iran is a country, barely 100 million people, with the kind of resources it has, most importantly, not oil resources alone, but the resources as human resources and the cultural uh, history it has, not only as a country, but also in the region. Its influence has been far wider than people sitting in the West or even in India would really understand. Its influence in West Asia as well as in Central Asia. So given that history, that if Iran is able to emerge, and I think uh, what you are saying, I agree with, that it looks like that the game for the Trumpian approach is over, then we are going to see a new correlation of forces uh, arise in the region, not free from conflict, but certainly giving a much greater role to Iran than we have seen till today, because Iran, in spite of all of the uh, forces against it, has played a very important role, as we saw in West Asia, against the Daesh, ISIS, against various other forces arranged over there, so I think that can only go bigger, grow bigger with time. And that's what you are indicating. So I think at this moment, it seems to be a situation where things may start looking better after Trump leaves. And hopefully the Indian government will also take lessons from what is happening and re-look re at its West Asian policies, which I think at the moment has been rather one-sided. But I'm going to leave that discussion for another day. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bhandra Kumar, for being with us.